Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Fundamentals of an Effective Custom Residential Contract webinar. Before we get started, I'm going to briefly go over a few housekeeping items. This presentation and information discussed today is protected by U.S. and international copyright laws. You will receive an email within the next week with a recording of this presentation along with a copy of the slides for your convenience. And this copyright does apply to those materials as well. If you have any questions regarding the topics discussed during this presentation, please place them in your question box on your GoToWebinar browser bar, and we'll try to answer as many of these at the end of the presentation or put you in touch with someone who can help. Next is our disclaimer. Any information presented during this webinar today is not intended to be provided as legal advice. We recommend you consulting with a licensed attorney in your jurisdiction for further information. And finally, this course is available for one learning unit. If you provided your AIA number upon registration, I will be automatically reporting your attendance with the AIA. You should see this reflected on your transcript in five to 10 business days. If you did not submit that um, AIA number, you can simply send an email on over to the email that you received for the webinar, and I will submit that registration information for you. So here are a few learning objectives for today's presentation. I'm not going to go over them in detail one by one, but we just have this here as a reference for on what you'll be learning today. So with all that fun stuff out of the way, I'm going to turn it over and let our presenters introduce themselves. Michael, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you, Molly. Good morning or afternoon, as case may be. I am Michael Bell. I'm both an architect and an attorney, but I make my living as an architect. I spent six years of my life as a law student and attorney. Otherwise, I've practiced architecture over 30 years of it as the principal of my firm here in New Orleans, Bell Architecture. My work is almost exclusively custom residential. As an architect lawyer, I've remained fascinated with how design and construction interrelate with the law and contracts, and uh, that brought me to AIA's Documents Committee, where I spent 13 years, chaired it in 2017 and 18, and retired in 2021. But the highlight of my service on the Documents Committee was participating in the creation of these agreements, uh, new agreements that we're going to talk about today that are for custom residential architecture. Leonard? Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome. I'm Leonard Cady, one of the contributing authors of these new residential documents. I chaired the residential group that created these documents. My firm, Leonard Cady Architecture and Design, is in New York City, and we've been doing custom residential architecture for over 25 years, both here and abroad. I have been using AIA owner architect agreements since the inception of my firm and found their instructional value to be critical to professionally delivering architectural services. Next slide. As a committee um, made up of AIA members and industry experts, our goal is for the design and construction industry to treat the AIA contract documents as a standard. We gather continuous feedback from document users like you learn from them, and continually modify the documents. The Documents Committee is supported by AIA committee members, including architects and lawyers, and members of the construction industry made up of insurance companies, contractors, owners, and builders. We put a lot of effort into developing and supporting fair and balanced documents. If we favored architects only, nobody would use the documents. We have to balance the competing interests of those who sign these agreements and need to put risk on the party best able to financially manage that risk. Next slide. AIA has been publishing standard agreements and forms for 130 years. These forms evolve to reflect the changing world of design and construction and its increasing litigiousness. There are nearly 200 AIA documents and forms. Next slide. You might ask, why is it important to use a thorough and current contract? We assume most of you are using written agreements for your projects. The terms agreement 
and contract can be used interchangeably. AIA uses the friendlier term agreement in its titles, but it's the same as a contract. A contract is essential for risk management because a good contract allocates the risk to the party that can best bear that risk, partly through insurance and partly through the contract provisions that address scope and responsibilities of the parties. Contract law is fluid, and it's important to use a current contract to keep up with it. The nature of practice also changes. A recent example is sharing of digital models. The contract is also a way to educate the client about the design and construction process. Many residential clients have never worked with an architect. We suggest that you walk your clients through the contract so that they can understand what to expect and what is required of them. A thorough contract also tells architects what to do. Step-by-step -step articles of the agreement provide excellent guidance for the delivery of your services. Next slide. Here's a little background on how the AIA made efforts to help the custom residential industry. Back in 2005, we sought to gather information from you so that we could best serve you and support you. We sent out a survey to members of AIA's Small Project Practitioners, SPP, Small Project Exchange, SFX, and Custom Residential Architects Network, CRAN. By the way, all these interest groups are excellent resources for residential architects. We received almost 400 responses. We asked several questions. Number one, what types of agreements do you use for custom residential projects? We asked, what modifications do you make to AIA document language? We asked, how do you, your residential agreements differ from those uh, for other projects? And we asked for suggestions as to how to make AIA agreements better for residential projects. The answers were a cause for concern. 50% of respondents said they used letter agreements. We found more bad news. Of those using AIA documents, most use the very cursory B105 and A105. So we wondered and asked why the reluctance to use more thorough documents. Next slide. The top three um, reasons architects gave for using a short contract were Anything longer is intimidating to our clients. AIA documents are written for non-residential projects and they're too legalistic. The most common theme is that a document longer than a letter scares clients, but your clients see and sign licensing agreements and terms of service all the time. That includes purchase and mortgage documents to pay for this architectural home you're designing. Owners wanna know what to expect from you. They appreciate knowing what if we exceed our budget and what do I do if we suspend the project? It was clear to us that clients aren't intimidated. Most architects just don't want to address the contracts in the detail they deserve. As for some respondents claims that AIA documents aren't residential enough, the most common edits they made had to do with consultants, dispute resolution provisions, or adding a limitation of liabilities clause. Their edits looked a lot like a commercial contract and not as much about the specifics in residential work. Custom residential and commercial projects are so fundamentally the same that we can start with the same contracts and make a few edits. Next slide. You might ask, what the problems are with a letter agreement. The biggest problems are unanticipated items and the what ifs. Those are the terms that make up half of a long contract. You don't need terms until you need them. At the most basic level, we see letter agreements that say, this is what you'll get and this is how much you'll pay for it. 
uh, you know, pay us. There's a general awareness that it's wise to say more. And over time, architects add important provisions that they realize are needed in a letter agreement. Unfortunately, these realizations sometimes come from experience the hard way. AIA has already done the work of addressing those hard lessons. Remember, these basic terms and conditions have been accumulated over hundreds of years of construction law experience. Next slide, Michael. Thank you, Leonard. So I want to first say that selecting an entity in contracts is a business decision. It can have a big impact on profitability, and it's uh, as much as we don't, a lot of us uh, don't want to deal with uh, contracts. It's uh, it's important to not take it lightly. And when you're selecting a contract for your project, you should select a contract after you consider and evaluate the project's scope of services, complexity, and risk profile. I hope you're familiar enough with AIA documents to understand how part of what we're showing here is which owner architect agreement in the left column goes with uh, which owner contractor agreements. On the left are your choices uh, from least complex at the bottom to most complex at the top and on the same on the right. Um, and you know that the A201 general conditions gets paired with um, one of those other three contracts to the left of it. When you choose a contract, you should analyze critically the scope, complexity, and risk. You'll find that B105 or an A105 are uh, very rarely appropriate. Unless you're doing a custom residential project, um, you'll likely want to use a B101. And uh, if you are doing a custom residential project, B110 is now the go-to form. Um, a B110 is, is uh, much more like a B101 uh, than the less thorough B104 and very short B105. We'll get into the details of that in a little bit. Um, but for the next three slides, I'm going to walk you through some examples of this analysis of uh, scope, complexity, and risk. Um, they are all real examples from my practice. We'll look at the B105, the B104, and then the B101. Next, Molly. So the B105 is an owner-architect agreement that may be safely used for some projects, both residential and commercial, but the B105 is, is really for low-risk, simple projects, as is the A105, which is the owner-contractor agreement that goes with it. Um, when we were developing uh, the custom residential documents, we started calling the B105 and A105. Um, uh, well, they are they're what they were. I'm sorry, they were back before 2017. They were called the uh, short form agreements. They'd previously been described as documents for residential or small commercial projects, and that likely contributed to their overuse. They said residential and so it seemed like this was the right document but um, um closer examination would have revealed otherwise titles are are really important in our soundbite world look at the critically at the uh, b105 you know a lot is missing <clears throat> the same goes for the a105 so i um will give you um, an example of when a B105 is appropriate, but I'll tell you now that on the AI Documents Committee, we refer to it in the A105 owner-contractor agreement as the quote-unquote driveway replacement agreements, um, which um, should tell you what we thought it was appropriate for. Um, B105 exists for the most minimal project, and really it exists because residential architects Prior to our uh, survey in 2017, residential architects um, had been clamoring for short, and that's why we, for short documents, and that's why we <clears throat> went to, um, um, that's why we develop, we addressed them and these, uh, the need for new custom residential documents. Next slide, Mom. So. Um, I'll give you an example when a B105 worked for us. If you look at that photo on the left, you'll see that there used to be a porch there. You can see the shadow of the pilasters. It was a two-story porch. It had a roof coming out over those three windows. And uh, the client 
had a contractor replacing rotten wood. And uh, as often happens down in, uh, here in New Orleans, they found more termites than they bargained for. And they eventually uh, soon demolished the entire old front porch on this 1940s home. The client realized that a single story porch would look better than the two story porch he had removed. And so he asked us to design it. Um, so we did our uh, scope complexity risk analysis and determined that the very short B105 was appropriate for this project. We found that the, the scope was small. Um, we would design a lighter porch, uh, a lighter in weight porch over an existing foundation. The complexity of the service was easy. The design would be simple. Um, we One sketch uh, was all it took and when approved, we would just execute the construction drawings. The owner would get it built. The risk was small for these reasons, but also because the owner is a friend. And uh, so we found that the B105 was appropriate for this uh, very small project. Next. <clears throat> so the B104 is much more like a B101 than like the short, short B105. Um, again, there was a name change in 2017 we it had been called an owner architect agreement for projects of limited scope um, but you should also consider the complexity and risk um, when choosing your agreement rather than just scope so we decided that the appropriate name was the uh, abbreviated form of agreement and that word abbreviated pretty much captures what's going on here the five phases become only three phases uh, schematic design and design development are um, are combined as are construction documents and uh, bidding and negotiation. Um, but it's missing a lot of the scope, um, descriptions of the scope where the architect tells the owner what the architect is going to do. Um, it is uh, coordinated with the A104 owner contractor agreement, which I think is a is it was a good thing. Um, but um, so when will we use a B104? Next slide. So this little project here is a small pool house and we used the B104 on it. Um, we did our analysis. Uh, the scope of services um, was uh, unlike our B105 example, that porch. Here we did want an approval of, uh, of a few design drawings before we drew the CDs, but the design was not so complex that we needed the layers of design that SD schematic design and design development represent. We knew the contractor, so we didn't need much spelled out as to uh, bidding and negotiation. But the two phases of uh, needing both design and construction documents, you know, pushed us uh, up out of a B105 and into a B104 as to our scope of services. Regarding the complexity of the project, you know, this was not a whole house or even multiple rooms, and it was to be traditional and looked like it was always in the backyard of this traditional home. We weren't making a contemporary uh, design statement here. So we thought the complexity of the project was uh, moderately low. And risk, um, different things can affect risk. Here we saw that uh, we'd worked with this client and this contractor before, and they'd actually worked together before. Um, um, so we knew we knew they knew our process and we knew what to expect from them. So um, we thought that a B104 seemed to hit the mark. Um, before we get into more complex agreements, I'll share with you that you know your practice is different than mine, but I'll use a B105 or a B104 rather than a the longer B101 or B110 on maybe one in 10 or 20 projects. We're usually using the longer agreements. Um, and just keep in mind, again, that the AI wrote the B105 and the B104 way back uh, when, because architects were clamoring for short documents. And these, the B105 and the B104 do really have limited utility in your practice, I would suggest. Next slide. So, the AIA's flagship agreement, B101, um, as you can tell, I'm a fan of the B101. It's thorough enough to resolve all of the, the what ifs, um, which when you don't resolve them, it can be costly. It has the traditional five phases of uh, 
of services provided by an architect. I think you know what those are. Um, it's uh, only basic cost and estimating that we uh, cost estimating and scheduling that we provide. Um, it's uh, got supplemental and additional services, and I'll use this opportunity. Most of you probably know this by now, but uh, we, the AIE owner architect agreements usually used to just have additional services. In 2017, we parsed that into supplemental services and additional serv services. Supplemental services are um, <clears throat> known at the outset of the project and can be negotiated and a fee can be put on what those supplemental services are. Um, for example, programming, if you're going to do programming for the, the owner, um, you can put it in the agreement as an Article 4 additional service and you can uh, say what that fee is going to be. Additional services are things that might arise during the project and these would include things like changing the scope of the project or if, if a code changes on you, some, some uh, legal aspect of your project changes and you have to modify, um, it's uh, rightfully additional services. Um, and these are usually billed uh, at the hourly rates that are filled into the contract. So B101 really, it provides a step-by-step -step guide to all that happens or could happen in, in a project. Um, of course, you see there it's coordinated with A201 general conditions and one of the three owner contractor agreements, the A101, 102, or 103. Next slide. So um, I'm going to spend a little time on this slide and tell you some stories. Um, it's it's uh, B101 has served us extremely well in our custom residential project practice. And since 2021, we've used um, the B110 almost exclusively. And um, so this, these documents came out in 2021. So B101 is really the basis for some experiences that I'll share with you. Um, and uh, I think that examples are, are the best way to illustrate some of the things we're talking about. Um, some of these might be termed war stories, um, but uh, I'm going to use them to tell you why a thorough document really best meets your needs. Um, anything that I say here about that was came about when we were using a B101 is going to work with the B110 also. So first example I'll give you is, is about five years ago, we discovered during construction documents that the owner surveyor mistakenly labeled a 14 foot utility easement or servitude on the side of our site as being only five feet. We had to redesign a significant part of the project shaving off nine feet. And when this came about, I pointed to the, to the owner, I pointed to the B101's articles. Uh, it happens in three places, one, three, and four which make it very clear that we were entitled to rely on information from the owner's surveyor and the necessary revisions to shave nine feet off the building were additional services for which we were to be paid. Now, didn't, it saved me a discussion with the owner about what would be fair. The contract said it for me. As an aside, I'll add that you must remember that you're required to ask for written authorization before you provide additional services. Again, those are the ones that arise during the project. Otherwise, you might be providing them for free. Um, a, a few, embarrassed to say it, but a few years ago, an owner tried to fire or terminate us. Of course, it was without good reason. But um, I was able to protect our interests and had more leverage in the terms of how we ended things because in B101, Article 7 has provisions uh, regarding copyrights, and they couldn't just take our drawings and have somebody finish the project. And the Article 9 termination provisions got me paid up to date. I did not actually collect the termination fee that I had inserted in the contract, but its presence helped me negotiate the rest of what, what I wanted so as to, to make a completely clean break with the owner, including hold, harmlessness, et cetera. All that is what I wanted. And I think the owner actually appreciated th that we had in the contract it spelled out what to do in this situation. It just saved us both a lot of headaches. Uh, on another project, I'm sure you may have run into this, an owner wanted to sell her lot and assign her contract with me to the purchaser. And uh, 
10.3 and B101 made it very clear that they needed my consent. I did not mind the assignment, um, but a change of owners does necessitate additional effort on an architect's part in order to get things rolling again. I explained this and I agreed to the assignment on the condition that the new owner pay us for that added effort. I can't tell you, another example, I can't tell you how many times I've looked uh, to B101's 4211 to explain how the owner changing his mind means we get paid to revise the design accordingly. In fact, this is one that I point out, this provision I pointed out at the outset when we use the uh, contract as sort of a roadmap for the project to educate the client, as Leonard talked about. I try to impress on owners that we need decisions from them that we can rely on. It makes them look at our drawings a little harder. If they don't do that and they change their mind later, well, they, pay up, they have to pay up. Again, get the authorization for additional services in writing. That's what the contract says, and that seems only fair. You should talk about it before you just send the owner a bill for extra time. We always fill in a limit on site visits in B101's 423. We sometimes have to cite this limit on visits when the owner goes with the low bid and the burden falls on us to work harder to get the owner what she contracted for. Um, Similar limits are in B101 for review of shop drawings, visits to determine substantial completion, and the like. Um, section 6.6 .6 in B101 and B110 spells out what to do in a budget bust, and it provides a reasonable roadmap for the parties to follow when this happens. This may require us to provide V services without compensation, but it requires the owner to cooperate too. It shows them the path forward, possibly saving you from their temptation to say, you know, you blew the budget, or you're fired. A fair amount of B101 Inc. addresses cost of overruns, and I think we all know why. The provisions on this are very fair to both architect and owner. Um, another example, a story is similar with fast tracking. It's uh, If it's not agreed to at the outset, you can point to Article 1's in initial information um, into the supplemental services table showing that it was never contemplated. Um, and uh, 421 also makes it an additional service entitled, entitling you to extra compensation. Just be sure that you didn't end up fast tracking the project because you were behind on the schedule you committed to. Um, so the abbreviated B104 helps with most of these examples, but not all of them. B101 and now B110 help with all of them. You know, thorough contract is just good for everybody. The bust, bust, budget bust, excuse me, example, save the owner. Um, other examples saved us. Put it in the contract as the AI is done, and we don't have to argue about what's fair. These provisions can have tremendous financial implications for your practice. Um, as the use of, uh, for example, an A110 instead of a shorter A105 can have for a contractor's uh, finances. So for many years, the B101 should have been your starting point for full architectural services on custom residential projects. But as of 2021, we've had a better choice, the B110, and uh, Leonard's gonna talk to you about that now. Next slide. I think you're on it. Molly, the next slide. Oh, okay. What is unique to residential contracts is jurisdictional requirements, laws that protect consumers from unscrupulous residential contractors, and most specific to residential construction is the client and how they understand a residential project. The client is emotionally invested in their home. The client is probably not knowledgeable about the construction process or the terminology. For example, what is an allowance? The architect and builder may have to do a lot of explaining and managing of expectations and work hard to keep relationships going smoothly. Next slide. <clears throat> the new AIA residential documents streamline the contractual process for architects by tailoring them for the distinctive requirements of the custom residential construction market. The suite includes A110 2021 
standard form of agreement between owner and contractor for a custom residential project. And B110, 2021, standard form of agreement between owner and architect for a custom residential project. These are the first documents published by the AIA specifically developed for use in custom residential design. Next slide. Previously, architects and contractors have successfully used other AIA agreements for their custom residential projects. Small differences in custom residential projects, however, meant that some content was not relevant and could be ignored, while other information needed to be added. The new document title, having the word residential um, in them, communicate that they have been vetted for custom residential projects and will need fewer, if any, edits. Next slide. The B110 is based on the B101, as Michael has referred to earlier, and the A110's evolution more closely follows A104. Next slide. B110 2001 was developed from the B101 2017 standard form of agreement between owner and architect. They are similarly structured. Basic services comprise the same five phases of service, schematic design, design development, construction documents, bidding and negotiation, which is also referred to as procurement, and construction administration. In both agreements, the architect still provides basic supplemental and additional services. While the architect provides general estimates of cost and scheduling, detailed estimates are a supplemental service. Like the B101, the B110 offers a variety of compensation methods, including a stipulated sum or a percentage of the value of the work or other, prompting the architect to insert another method such as an hourly rate or a hybrid where, for example, an hourly rate for schematic design may be followed by another method of compensation for the next four phases. Next slide, Michael. I think that's still you, Leonard. I, I think take... we're on to the next slide, Michael. Um, okay. Um, so the uh, I'll talk to you about how the B110 differs from the B101. Um, I want to first point out that what's the same between the B101 and 110 is largely why B110 is so successful. We just added and uh, subtracted some things, and we changed the all-important title to custom residential. Next slide. So many jurisdictions have laws that are unique to residential construction, often to protect the homeowner. The new documents include prompts to remind architects and contractors to include these provisions. Some examples include consumer protection warranties and related notices, lien laws, licensing requirements. Louisiana, we have the New Home Warranty Act, which uh, by statute uh, is required to be referenced in every contract for uh, residential um, construction in the state of Louisiana. Um, other jurisdiction specific requirements may include uh, requirements as to sustainability, historic preservation, zoning, and additional, further additional requirements may come from a homeowners association. So all that is uh, to be uh, included and there are prompts to include that in the document. Next slide. So more differences. Um, one is that uh, sustainability is not precluded in, in the B110, but the B101 specific provisions directed towards sustainability and 
B101's requirement to use a sustainable projects exhibit were deleted in the B110. Um, sustainability services are still listed as a supplemental service on an Article 4 table that can be agreed to prior to the um, start of the project. And um, sustainable objectives can be included using the E204, uh, which is AIA's sustainable projects exhibit, um, to allow owners to flesh out sustainability goals if desired. However, um, although it was uh, these specific uh, more um, extensive provisions regarding sustainability were uh, removed, there, there is uh, the architect is still required, as the architect has been in several years in the B101, is still required to consider sustainable design alternatives in the schematic design phase. There's also no initial decision maker in this uh, reference in this document because it is unlikely that one would be required in custom residential projects other than the architect, um, which is the old way that the B101 worked before a third party initial decision maker was provided for in the uh, more recent B101s. The, agreement, the agreements also reduce uh, the requirements for digital data protocols and transmission because residential projects are generally less complicated than commercial projects uh, with regards to digital data and how it is used. Next slide. So the B110 does not include engineering as a basic service. It's um, uh, treated as a supplemental service in the B110. And this is because uh, Different architects uh, doing custom residential projects seem to handle engineering um, in a variety of ways. Uh, structural engineering, mechanical, electrical services also um, are not always quantifiable as a cost, and the program may change as the projects evolve. Um, and often mechanical and electrical services are provided on a design-build basis on these projects. Um, and making them supplemental services builds in flexibility for variations in our practices. Um, rebuilding with a different, rebidding with a different contractor is also uh, an additional service. In residential projects, we find unsophisticated owners uh, often have eyes bigger than the costs they can stomach. And uh, when they don't like the price that comes in, they'll want to try again for a better price. So the in the B110, the bidding and negotiation phase has been clarified to include one concurrent effort. The architect will assist in one round of bidding and negotiation under basic services, it says. If the owner wants to send the project out to bid a second time, hoping to get a lower price, any efforts that the architect expends in, expends in doing that will be compensated as additional services. Um, B1 of the 110 also simplifies some of the record keeping requirements for the construction administration service. Uh, one more thing, in addition, the B110 clarifies that the owner will retain one single contractor per to perform the work. Um, that's uh, just sort of understood in a B101 situation, but in residential projects, Owners are more likely to think they can contract the project themselves and save themselves the contractor's fee. We, of course, try to show them the fallacy in that and how that often doesn't turn out so well. And that's a story for another day. But if the owner elects to hire subcontractors directly and act as a general contractor, the architect could be entitled to additional compensation because of the additional work required to coordinate such a project. Next slide. So um, in the, we deleted some inapplicable supplemental services, uh, such as creating BIM models for post-construction use, facility support services, commissioning. Yeah, back when we used the B101, just the presence of these things uh, could be off-putting to an owner. I found most ignored it, but it could be off-putting. You know, why are these things in here? This looks like a... Uh, contract for more a more commercial project than my custom residence. Um, so we just edited those out. Um, and we edited in some services that were more specific to custom residential. And uh, these include like hardscape design, 
Um, the, and of course, as I mentioned, the MEP instructional engineering services are part of basic services in the B101, but we're moved, we're moved to uh, supplemental services in B110. And uh, we also provided that the uh, engineering services can be provided by the owner or the architect. Um, you know, again, we found that engineering services are handled in various manners on custom residential projects. Next slide. So there's the table in the B110 custom residential document. What is highlighted is new to the B110 table and not in the B101 table. Again, the all important engineering services there and uh, a couple of other things I talked about. Um, Finally, uh, let, one more slide, please, on this, on differences here. So, uh, here's a final slide on this. Some of the other differences on between the B110 and the 101 are that we've streamlined some provisions as to insurance, uh, which uh, now basically there's some more simple infill prompts in the B110. Owner contractor communications provision is streamlined now to read. Quote, the owner shall endeavor to communicate with the contractor through the architect about matters arising out of or relating to the contract documents. That may look familiar to you because it was the language in the old B101. Then the B101, current B101, has uh, actually made expounded on that and made it a little bit more complicated. But this, this version of uh, redressing communications works just fine for most custom residential projects. Um, mediation guidelines were reduced down to one paragraph. And owner provided information has been expanded to uh, include the need to um, add in property and site covenants, conditions and restrictions on the property, and homeowners association requirements. Next. Leonard. Thank you. So switching over now to um, the owner contractors agreement, uh, A110 is based on the previous form that we know, A104, which is an abbreviated version of the A101 and A201 paired owner architect, uh, owner contractor agreement. General conditions are included within the agreement A110, like a104. Next slide. In A110, there are three types of compensation options. Stipulated sum, cost of the work plus a fee, cost of the work plus a fee with a guaranteed maximum price. Next slide. The B101 owner architect agreement underwent more modifications to become B110, then A104 underwent to become A110. The biggest change was A110's coordination with B110. Like B110, uh, the document prompts for jurisdictional requirements unique to building homes. We also made some edits to acknowledge how homes are built a little differently commercial projects. Similarly, we find liquidated damage provisions extremely challenging to referee in a custom residential project. There are a few others, but these are the highlights. Next slide. We think you'll like these documents. The only thing we can't offer is brevity. And I'm, and I'm sure you'll agree um, we don't think brevity is in your best interest. As architects, we want to lead the process on our projects. We have to know a lot of things to do that. And it's important to know your contracts. Lead on your contracts, take control of the trajectory of your projects, and your practice will be better covered and prosper. Your clients will appreciate that you take their financial interests very seriously. Next slide. Paul, well, if you just go In back, addition, um, uh, Leonard was just on. I wanted to add something um, sure. that you know, 
for me, uh, these these documents that you that we've we've we're talking about, and uh, for years, I, I really people uh, a, lot, a lot of my I've heard the complaint that you know owners would don't like a long document, and we talked about that earlier. But the uh, I never really got pushback from owners as on a B101. They just trusted me. It said that it was an owner architect agreement from the AIA, and we pretty much uh, entered them as written. Um, but I did get pushback from contractors on using an A101 and an A201. I mean, that's a lot of paper. And so I, I like the B101 owner architect agreement, extensive one, but I like the abbreviated owner contractor agreement, the A104, because it was just seemed it was a little less lengthy um, than the A101 paired with the A201 general conditions. So as part of my practice before these documents came out, I was uh, in the habit of, I was trying to, I would edit an A104 to pair better with a B101. So that's, I'm taking the owner contractor agreement. And that's the middle of the road one and trying to pair it with a the extensive owner architect agreement. And I did that. And, uh, for years and uh, it it worked okay but um for me the best part about these two documents uh, these new documents was that we went to the a104 as the basis for the a110 and so this what i was doing uh informally was uh, handled in these in these new documents and so you know uh, i've had Contractors don't don't push back anymore. The A110 seems appropriate, and it's it's titled for a custom residential project, which again is uh, it's amazing how important the title is. And the B110 is also, and so we've uh, for three year, or two or three years now um, have been using these documents, uh, the A110, and the B110, and, and getting very little pushback. So um, I, I find it perfect for my practice, and I hope you will for yours also. Next slide. So um, the documents we've been uh, talking about are um, for residential home construction. If you do other types of work, we have other owner contractor agreements and project management forms, including payment applications, change orders, certificate, so substantial completion. So. Um, but it's also possible that you do other types of residential projects. Of the around 200 contracts and forms and other documents that the AI Contract Documents Program publishes, here are three that might be of some use to you that I think are worth, we think are worth pointing out to you. One is, is that uh, A145 is uh, applicable if you're doing architect-led design build for homes. It does a good job of addressing the issues there. Um, B107 is, uh, if your client is a developer builder, as an owner and contractor, um, this could be useful, but use it with caution. It's the only document we have where we suggest it's okay to stop at a permit set. But again, it's for a sophisticated and specific type of client, an, who, an owner who's also a contract contractor, and don't use it with a homeowner. B109 is probably uh, is more for multifamily than single family, and uh, you know maybe some of you do that type of work and would find it useful. Next slide. Um, so we have these other documents for residential projects that may be use of use to you if you work for a home builder in a non-traditional architect role. The A111. Um, and th these are new too, as you can tell by the date there. The A111 is if you're, there's no architect involved, but you're um, you're building a single family home for the client. A112 is if you're designing, providing the design somehow and constructing a single family home. And the A113 is for um, sort of simple remodeling projects. And so they may be useful to some of you and wanted you to be aware of them. Next slide. Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, I wanted to just add that uh, we we talked about how um, architects occasionally would prefer to use um, letter agreements, and um, it, it's 
quite ironic because we prepare very detailed contract documents and contractors sign these documents and and of course it's for the protection of uh, contractors and so it's it's important to consider the parity um, and um, balance and um, how uh, architect owner agreements um, also should spell out all these things clearly and um, again I, I think the client appreciates that so in addition to just contracts um, AIA offers project management forms, including payment applications, change orders, certificates of substantial completion. Uh, three good ways to get them and the contracts we've discussed is to purchase a single document on demand, um, a document on demand that has editing uh, capability, or a uh, fully editable document on demand through the subscription process. Um, AIA, next slide. AIA has many resources for you, uh, links for how um, you can learn more and um, you may have questions and um, you know how to get help for those questions. AIA also has a growing set of videos on YouTube and this webinar will also be published and available to you, um, guides. And so we'd like to thank you for your interest in AIA contract documents and the new residential agreements. And we've hope, we hope you've learned something and uh, you prosper in your practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael and Leonard. That was fantastic. You covered so much information in such a short amount of time. We have about eight minutes left in our slotted hour. Um, I would love to have a chance to put out some questions that have come through. Y'all have had a lot of questions. We will not get to all of them in eight minutes, but I'm just gonna come up, send out a couple that I think would be the best for the good of the group listening. If we do not get to your question, that doc info at aicontracts.com that is on the screen is where I would send your question in. They can either answer that question or they'll get you back in touch with Leonard and Michael and to let them try to answer your question if we can. So we had two questions come in about supplemental and additional services. So this is a two part question, but one person asked, can you repeat and emphasize the difference between supplemental and additional services? Michael, I'll let you take that. Okay. Um, Yes, uh, supplemental services are, and the, the new additional services were both part of what was additional services in, before 2017, and they uh, the differences between them were enough that we decided to break them out, and you'll see them broken out into the in the contract, whether you're looking at B101 or B110. And a supplemental service is a service that is uh, can be contemplated. Uh, prior to you know the formation of the agreement, like you can say, um, we are going to provide programming and we're going to charge you know x thousands of dollars to do that. Additional services are things that um, uh, arise during the project, um, like uh, the owner has uh, approved a set of schematic design drawings. You start drawing uh, design development drawings, and then the owner says, wait a minute, I want to make a change here. And you've already expended effort in uh, uh, um, your design development drawings that you have to, you lose that effort or have to uh, change, uh, redo it. And uh, and so there's a, uh, before you do that, uh, you go and do that, you say, hey, Ms. Uh, owner, I, um, we need to charge you, It's gonna. there's gonna be a cost in, in changing uh, and doing these revisions because we move forward in reliance on your approval. And so that's an additional service, something that happens during the course of the project. There are several other ones, and I would encourage you to look at, uh, that's all in Article 4 of um, the, the B101 or the B110. You can look at Article 4, and um, there are sample documents that are available from the AIA website, and that's that's probably what I would suggest doing is going and reading all the different examples of what 
could be a supplemental service and what could be an additional service. Thank you. So then this second question is a great way to just to clarify, are supplemental services anything that is not typically part of the architect's role? Um, maybe. Um, there are su supplemental services like programming, which I would say an architect typically uh, is very, you know, maybe, maybe qualified to do. Um, other supplemental services, like there's a table of them um, that you can say before you sign the contract, whether you're doing them or not and how much you're being paid for them. Other ones would include like civil engineering services. And, you know, I, I think that, uh, and I think most architects involved in this sort of thing think that that's probably best not under the architect's umbrella, but it's listed as a supplemental service that uh, as an architect you can agree to do, but uh, that would be something that as uh, you asked the question is, uh, is uh, I think that's something that's not typically within the architect's role. Thank you. So then I have one more, we'll see how quickly you answer this one if we have time for another one. And again, at any point, if we're touching into legal advice, please let me know, because I know this is a fine line, but which agreement would you recommend with the contractor for a custom residential project where the architect is also the owner? Hmm. Where the architect is the owner. The architect is the owner. Yes. Um, I don't think that would change my uh, analysis. Uh, it, there's a little bit of a complication in that um, the architect cannot really be the, and this is probably where the questioner is headed, the architect is, uh, you know, we are required to be a neutral in owner-contractor relations, and it's hard for the architect to be a neutral when the architect is also the owner um kind of have me stumped on that one I, I would say I, but i'll tell you this um i have done personal projects as architect and i have used the um the b101 and now i would use the b110 but there uh there is the potential if things go awry there is the potential where um it could be said that i couldn't be neutral when i'm also the owner so i i, I would I would. I think that the greater good is to use the these these documents we're talking about, like the B110. But um, I, I do understand that there's a there's a problem there, and the contractor would have to be comfortable with that apparent conflict of interest. Awesome. Okay. This last question, I think you can answer kind of quickly, and it hits on a couple other questions that came in. It said, "Does the owner need to use an A110 with the contractor in order for the B110 to be valid?" I would say not for, I'm sorry, if Leonard, jump in if you want to uh, well, address it. I, I think that the two can uh, work apart or together, um, but we envisioned them working in uh, coordination. And so ideally they'd, they'd work together, but you, you could separate the two and um, it will work separately. They're, they're designed to go together. It certainly wouldn't. Uh, invalidate the uh, the use of a different uh, uncoordinated contracts would not invalidate the other, but it certainly um, if things go awry and there's a fight, uh, it certainly can complicate things if there are inconsistencies between the owner contractor agreement and the owner architect agreement. Because as you've you know, when we talk about how they're coordinated and they should be used together, one of the things is is that in the owner contractor agreement, there are duties uh, listed that, especially during construction, that uh, the architect is supposed to provide. So it it's uh, you know we we insist that the A110 be used with the B110, and generally we we succeed, but we do run in the contractors, as I'm sure others of you have as well, who have their own uh, contract and come hell or high water, that's what they want to use. And uh, you just sort of hope you don't get in a dispute and have to sort through the inconsistencies. Perfect. 
Well, with that, we are out of time. So again, I'm so sorry if we did not have a chance to get to your question. That doc info at aiecontracts.com is a great resource if you still have some questions on this topic. A huge thank you to Michael and Leonard. This was an amazing presentation. And thank you to everyone in the audience for your interest in AIA contract documents and attending our webinar today. I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you.